All right, more news. It's Ed Dean, Roger Henderson, Jonathan Bidlack. I love Economist. By the way, one of my most Economist names I know, Jonathan. But anyway, Jonathan <laughs> Bidlack, our good friend, comes on with us quite routinely. His website, by the way, I want to talk about that real quick. I'm going to get to some of the spending and recession things that may or may not happen this year, Jonathan. SpendingTracker.org. We've used some of that stuff for some of our articles. Of course, we give you proper credit at FloridaDaily.com and on this radio show. But SpendingTracker.org. Jonathan, you actually have have it where, and by the way, you point this on both sides, Democrats, Republicans, and you let them know what party they are of some of the spending that they're bringing back to their area. Explain the website of SpendingTracker.org before we go to some of the issues here. Sure. Yeah. Well, first, thanks for having me. Uh, the site's pretty simple. I mean, it, bas- it basically says, uh, you know, it looks at every every government estimate as to how much every piece of legislation is going to spend, and it just cross-references them with uh, with who voted for them. So you can literally go on and see, you know, pull up your member of Congress and see which pieces they're voting for and how much spending is in it and, and how they compare to uh, to the rest of the rest of the Congress. So it's a, it's a really great accountability site, I think. J- Jonathan, for the audience out there, do you follow the earmark? as well or just the overall generic part of the bill yeah it's the overall it's the overall cost so i mean if there are earmarks inserted into a bill that the congressional budget office is providing estimates on then that'll be included so uh you know usually it includes again the final the final cost of the bill so it should be should be all inclusive jonathan bidlock again economist the website is spendingtracker.org again that's spendingtracker.org so let's gloss over some of these issues coming into uh, you know it's january now you know when you talked, not you, but in the 1990s, when Clinton and these guys talked about a five-year balanced budget, they were able to get to them due to some of the spending cuts, at least cuts off government growth. Listen, I, I like the idea that the GOP wants to go with a balanced budget, but can we please cut out the nonsense of a 10-year balanced budget? Economies change. Congress has changed. They don't abide by these laws. When you hear this, I know you got to be rolling your eyes as an economist. Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, look, I mean, these... You know, these estimates oftentimes that anything out further than maybe five years at the most is really, you know, gets to be questionable in terms of its reliability, at least when you're talking about most of the discretionary items that they're voting on, uh, you know, to begin with. So, uh, you know, it's, I mean, I, I do think it's funny. I mean, you think back to the Paul Ryan years, you know, or, or before that, and, you know, it was sort of like, how are we going to go and build surpluses? And it was past the balance was, was quicker. And now it's sort of like 10 years is kind of the, kind of the pipe dream that we're really hoping we can get just to balance, which, you know, of course, what that really means is that you'd be accumulating, uh, you know, additional debt during all of that time. So, you know, I mean, there are other potential solutions I think that we could talk about, but, uh, you know, we're in, we're in a pretty serious situation right now, especially in the environment uh, after the last few years with all of the COVID funding, because, Correct. you know, we kind, we kind of did all this stuff off budget anyway, and just, and just blew up the, the, the federal fiscal picture. When, uh, when you hear Jim, Jim Jordan, and I like Jim Jordan, I know some of these individuals want to pass bills because they want to run for higher office, knowing it's not going to go anywhere, but that's okay, fine. I mean, I have no problem. I know they're looking at the, uh, uh, you know, dealing with the tax situation. I know it probably won't pass the U.S. Senate and get vetoed, but I, hey, at least it gets the conversation going, and I'm all in favor of that. Having said this, when they when Jordan starts talking about that everything is on the table, you, you're creating mm-hmm. a rift of the GOP on the issue of military spending. And, mm-hmm. I, I, yes, is there waste? I agree, but, I mean, I don't want to hear about wokeism. I know there was wokeism in the military. Excuse me, in the military, that I'm not, that isn't that's not a lot of cost of money. I want to know certain specifics of where they're cutting. Like, like I'm for eliminating the federal department of education, but I lay out certain government entities. The reason why we don't need it, I just don't make it a soundbite. So, and, and everybody doesn't have to agree with me on this, but should everything be on the table? And when we talk about military cuts, I'm like, okay, what exactly do you cut in the military? Yeah. Yeah. These are great questions. So first of all, I mean, you know, I, I, I am a, I am a proponent of the notion that everything should be on the table and that, you know, look, I mean, there's waste in all government agencies and there are critiques that we as, you know, conservatives and libertarians make of government, you know, when we talk about the Department of Education or agriculture programs or whatever it might be. And the reality is those same incentives often apply to the Department of Defense as well. And so there's this notion that somehow, you know, uh, there really isn't much waste in the Department of Defense. 
but uh, but there's waste everywhere else in government, and I think that that's incredibly unlikely. I mean, look, we have all sorts of you know uh, legacy weapon systems that are no longer needed that you know Congress continues to fund because maybe they're manufactured in their district or there's some sort of you know particular parochial value. Uh, so you know all of that kind of cronyism, right, that goes on between you know these private sector contractors and uh, and the federal government exists just as much as the Pentagon as it does anywhere else. And so, yeah. you know, I think that, uh, I mean, look, I mean, our, our, you know, we have this problem every year where, frankly, I mean, Congress, and, and, and you know, oftentimes goes and, and allocates more money to the Pentagon than they even ask for. Correct. Uh, and, continu- yes. and continues to fund things that they don't even want. So, you know, this idea that there's nothing that can be cut or, you know, look, I mean, the, the Pentagon, of, of course, they're always going to ask for more money because, you know, that's that's kind of their job, right? But but it, it's incumbent on Congress, I think, to impose that, a budget constraint on them and rather than just kind of go and throw even more money that they, yeah. that they don't need. Jonathan. Jonathan Bidlack is an economist. Uh, he's with several groups and then also his website, spendingtracker.org. Jonathan, I'm not asking you, and, and we don't endorse in the show, but, you know, we like free market ideas and conservative ideas. Roger, if I, you know, think about the campaign for a second. If the GOP campaigned and the, the attitude about, I understand whether you agree with investigations or not, but dealing things with the economy by saying we need to redo the tax structure. You're we right. want to look at government spending. Mm-hmm. I didn't even hear this a lot for the campaigns. They might have won more seats. They may have, Think about but it. unfortunately, <laughs> you find people yeah. on both sides. Once they get in power, they want to blow the budget. Yeah, J- that's, Jonathan, that's really what's going I, on. I, no, I'm saying if they had this type of attitude, they probably would have won more. Jonathan, talk to me. Um, Inflation, when you look at, just give me the overall here, inflation numbers you would have to assume are going to come down based on people are buying less. I don't know if I'd give a lot of it to the Fed. That could be some areas out there as well. Are we going to see higher interest rates remain while the inflation numbers drop this year? Uh, I think so. I mean, at least for the time being. I mean, there's no doubt that that you know the Federal Reserve is, is going to be, I think, cautious. I mean, I think most people acknowledge that you know they were a little bit slow on the uptake. Uh, you know, sort of expecting inflation to to be this temporary phenomenon, and then of course here we are. You know, a year and a half, almost two years later, and uh, and still seeing persistently higher prices. So, uh, you know, I think they're going to be very risk averse here, regardless of what the what the numbers look like for the time being. Uh, you know, the other the wild card, of course, is whether or not we enter into some sort of recessionary environment and you know there are mixed opinions on that and uh, you know if I had the exact answer I'd probably be running my own hedge fund at the right. moment but uh, but I think that uh, you know I think that there's a, that will be the that will be the wild card but I think that if you're if you're thinking about where the feds incentives are right now I think they're less worried about about you know having a, a lower economic growth uh, if that means that they're going to get inflation under control yeah I, I, it's interesting that when you talk about inflation and then you talk about interest rates and then you you talk about, of course, recession out there. And yeah, I, I think they all agree what you have said, that the economy is going to slow down. Whether we hit a recession, and if we do, I don't think it's, as of the, on the surface now, you wouldn't think it's going to be a deep one. I think you are going to see consumer uh, confidence drop a little bit. Uh, business confidence might be, you know, hanging up as being level. I mean, supply shortages haven't gotten fully better, but they got a lot of it better. But then again, mm-hmm. when you talk about consumer buying out there, that may really have have a major slowdown. Uh, is the housing market already in a recession right now? That's a, that's a great question. I think that's a, you know I think that's one of those situations where you know it really depends on what part of the country you're in. I mean, we saw we saw areas go and explode. Uh, you know, housing prices go up dramatically in a lot of exurbs, for example. You know, outside of major cities, as you know, people moved maybe a little further away during the pandemic, and now we're seeing some of those areas come back to earth. So, so that's one of those situations. That, that the question that's really hard to answer because you know, you, if you're outside of Washington D.C., that looks very different than outside of, of you know maybe San Francisco. So, uh, so that's the uh, I think that's the, that's the thing, and that's what makes this so hard, by the way, for for the Fed or for policymakers to take you know these actions because they can't really target these tools right, right. geographically or to this, those specific kind of conditions. And so, uh, you know, you end up taking these actions that uh, that may end up going and benefiting one area, but, uh, you know, could end up being the wrong action for, for a, a different area. Yeah, I think, uh, and I like it, uh, sometimes you, you, one thing I do enjoy having you come on 
in many cases, we get into certain specifics out there. But I like some of the things how we bring it up where you can just kind of gloss over. You hit certain things that kind of appeal to a lot of people that listen that may not get into the micro. And the question you've said, what is going to, you know, I, like I think I agree with you, inflation is going to come down, but interest rates may remain high. So we'll see where a lot of this goes. And I do think that uh, when it comes to consumer uh, buying out there, I think that's also going to slow down as well. But we'll see where a lot of this goes. Jonathan Bidlack, our friend, economist, and his website, SpendingTracker.org, SpendingTracker.org. Jonathan, thanks for always, my friend, for making the time. You bet. Thanks again for having me. You got it, man. And uh, I like him. His website's good. Shows a lot of the spending out there and some of the other groups out there that we always enjoy having come on as well.